Hello, Roger Liu here from the Virtual Technology Laboratory, and this is the second Virtual Cities Unity tutorial. In this tutorial, we are going to construct suburbs for our human to live in. So the last, in the last tutorial, um, I showed you a whole bunch of things, but uh, the main product, I guess, of our last expedition into Unity programming is our human prefab. In this tutorial, we'll focus on building residences for, for, I guess, it to live in, since we have uh, genderless humans. So our, uh, our terrain is 600 meters by 600 meters, and that's uh, smaller than a township, but for our, our intents and purposes, I think it should work okay. So we're going to construct suburbs for our human to live in. Eventually, we'll construct other types of houses, but... Uh, it makes sense, I think, to start with um, suburbs. And so in our terrain is 600 meters by 600 meters, and Unity by default gives us grid lines every 100 meters. And uh, this is actually pretty convenient for us because it turns out 100 by 100 meters works out to 2.5 acres, or just about 2.5 acres, almost on the dot. And that's basically the size of a city block. Uh, so if, if you consider your average lot size to be 0.25 acres, each of our blocks should have 10 lots. So what we want to do to begin that is to place a cube. And this cube is going to represent a suburb. And I'm going to place this cube at 250x, 1y, and 250z. Well, actually, I'm going to place it at 50z. So we can see the cube is actually floating. So when it's scaled at 1, 1, and 1, it's 1 meter on all dimensions. And its, it's transform is anchored to its center point. So if I want to be on the ground, then its Y position needs to be half of its scale. Uh, so if I change this, well, let's, uh, let's make our houses 4 meters tall. And then I'm going to change its uh, Y position to 2. And then this needs to represent the entire block. So I'm going to go ahead and scale this to 100 by 100. And turn off its mesh renderer. It will basically just be a container. But the box collider might be useful. And before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and check is trigger on the box collider. And that will be useful for uh, detecting, say, like if agents enter this particular suburb or not. Oh, let's go ahead and rename this suburb. And then let's go ahead and build a house now. I'm going to create another cube. And name it house. And place it at 250, well, actually, I'm just going to place it inside the suburb, and then zero it out. And then if I scale this to 1, 1, and 1, we can see it's exactly the same size. So its scale is relative to its parent. So if we want this, so say we want five lots across, east to west, and then we want two north to south, what we would want to do is drop the z size to 0.5 and drop the x size to 0 0.2, and that would make a lot that's the appropriate size. What I actually want to do is 
be able to put humans in the house and then see if they're awake or sleeping or home. And uh, to make that work, it makes sense to have walls but not have a ceiling. Again, this is uh, very abstract. There's, uh, there, there's definitely, um, I guess, higher fidelity in terms of visual appearance ways that you could do this. Uh, but again, that's not really the purpose at this point. Here we're more interested in building interactions. I'm also going to turn off the mesh renderer on the house. And I want to create walls, so I'm going to go ahead and create a cube. And then scale this on the X to 0.001. And then move this to 0 0.5. And that'll place it right on its edge. Now we have a wall on the other side. And then I'm going to create a entrance on the south end and a wall on the north end. Uh, so because our Z dimension is twice the size of our X dimension. If I want the walls to be the same, then the scale needs to be roughly half what our east and west walls are. I'm also rendering video in the background, so I apologize if this is a little loud. I hope that's not too much of an issue. And now I want to con create a container for our walls. I'm going to call it structure. And then I can clean up the naming of this by naming them all the same thing. If I go over to the inspector and then type wall and tab, or you could type enter, and that set them all to the, the same name. Let's uh, go ahead and create a material for our walls, and we'll call this house. Now let's go ahead and apply the texture to our walls by dragging it to each wall. In retrospect, yes, it would have been better if I assigned this before I started duplicating them. Uh, so by the fact that this says house, I know that all of these are consistent. And then I'm thinking a, a light blue might be nice for the house. Alright, so to create the house prefab, I actually don't want it nested under the suburb. I want it to be in the in in the root hierarchy so that the units are in meters and not scaled relative to the suburb. So to do that I can actually just drag it out and you'll note that Unity transformed the scale 
to match the space, and it actually kept it in the same location. Uh, so that can be a handy trick to kind of move things around and scale things. So now that it's at the root level of the hierarchy, I want to create a house prefab. And I'll do that by dragging house to my prefabs folder. So now I could populate the suburb with several different houses. Turns out that ends up being kind of a tedious task, and so we, I think we should de develop a way of shortcutting that. And we can create a Unity editor script that will essentially uh, allow us to push a button and populate multiple rows and columns of a prefab. So to do that, let's navigate to the scripts folder and then create a script named grid spawner. So in game pr programming lingo, spawn is to uh, create an object or to procedurally create an object. So that's where that name comes from. And then let's go ahead and open this up in C sharp. And we will format this. So what we want to do is create a public field for the object that we would like to replicate. So we'll do public game object object to spawn. And then we will want to define the, um, well, actually, let me go back to here. So the way this will work is inside of the prefab, we'll create an empty object, and this will be our grid spawner object. And then you'll note the grid spawner has a, a transform, but doesn't have anything else. And so by, by default, the blue axis is the grid spawner's forward vector. And the red axis is the grid spawner's right vector. So we can take advantage of that when we're writing the script. So what I want to do is place this at the center of the house in the lower quadrant. And then inside of I want to be able to specify how many houses I want in the forward direction and then how many houses I want in the right direction relative to that grid spawner. So I can do public int num forward. Let's give that a default value of 2. And then I can do public int num right and give that a value of 2. And then I want to define, be able to define the spacing between the objects. So say I wanted to space out the suburbs but leave a gap in between. Uh, because those are lots, that really doesn't make sense. Um, but that sort of functionality might be useful down the road. So I can do public, and then this I want to be a float so that I can do it in uh, non-meter increments. And I will call this forward spacing. And let's give that a default value of 1. And then I will want another public variable named right spacing. So let's uh, go back to our script and see if uh, we can get those public slots to show up. All right, so we have object to spawn, and this will end up being the house prefab that we just constructed. In the forward direction, we want 2. In the right direction, we want 5. For the forward spacing, we want these to be 50 units apart. 
this is in the world units and not in the transformed units. And then in the, the right spacing needs to be 20. So what we're going to do is create a public method, something that we haven't talked about yet, that will allow another script to run the method. So we'll type public and then void because it won't return something. Your, your method can return nothing, and in that case you would put void, or it can return a float or an integer or a boolean or basically any other type. So then we'll call this do grid spawn. And then inside of here, and then inside of here, we will need to iterate through each uh, position in the grid and create that game object and then place it in the correct location. So to do that, we'll use for loops. If you've done programming before, then that shouldn't be a new concept. Uh, but basically what you allows you to do is iterate so you don't have to type out the same thing over and over and over again. It's a way of sort of like reducing uh, the amount of code that you write and making it more flexible. Uh, so if we set it up without for loops, it would be you know much more difficult to have it so you could dynamically change the number of objects that you want in the forward direction and the number of objects that you want in the right direction. In C sharp to create a, a for loop, you type for and then parentheses, and then inside of it, we will type int for int i equals zero, and that basically declares and initializes an integer with the name i to zero. In a lot of programming languages, i, j, k are kind of typical values for these iterators, and then m and n are kind of typical for counts. So that's just why I like to use i. And then we'll do i less than num forward, semicolon, and then we'll do i plus plus. So i less than num forward is this, is the stopping condition. So when i, in this case, when i reaches 1, that would be the last time that i less than num forward would be true. And then i plus plus tells it to iterate i by 1 every single time through. So the, the first time through the for loop it's 0, then the second time it's 1. And then we'll need curly braces, and then we'll need another iterator to do the right direction. So we'll type for int j equals 0, j less than num right, j plus plus, and again we'll have brackets. And then to spawn in the editor is actually a little bit different than spawning in runtime. So to spawn in the editor, we need to do using Unity Editor. And inside of here, we will do game object go equals game object prefab utility dot instantiate prefab object to spawn. It looks like our IntelliSense has uh, stopped working. Uh, sometimes when that happens, uh, it works to just shut everything down and restart. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, I won't make you watch it. All right, so I restarted Unity, and lo and behold, the IntelliSense start, started working again. So game object is a light blue color, which basically says that it uh, recognizes what it is. So to create the game object, we're using the prefab utility, which is part of the Unity editor. If you are spawning in runtime, 
then you use it instantiate and uh, later on I'll probably end up showing you that. We do prefab utility dot instantiate prefab and then we give it the object that we want to spawn and this actually returns a object and not a game object and so we need to cast it to a game object. So that's what we're doing here. So our new object gets assigned to the variable named go. And then what we want to do is set its posi position to the grid spawner's position. That's why we like, placed it so carefully in that lower left corner, so we have a, a point to reference from. So we can do geo.transform.position equals transform.position. Then what we want to do is translate the object to its new position by doing geo.transform.translate. So we're using the translate method of the transform component that is on the house prefab game object. And there's several different ways that you can actually use this translate function. The one that we actually want to use is the last one, and this allows us to give it a, a direction in the x-axis, a direction in the y-axis, and a direction in the z-axis relative to a transform. And the transform that we happen to be using is that grid object. That's why I pointed out the blue axis is its forward transform, and the red axis is its right transform. So what we'll do is we will move it in the x direction by its right spacing times j, because j iterates with num right. And then in the y direction, we don't have to move it at all. And then in the z direction, we need to move it by forward spacing times i. And then lastly, we need to give it the transform, which is transform, because this is the grid spawner component. Then the next thing we want to do is change the name of the game object to something that's more meaningful. So to do that, we can do go.name equals object to spawn dot name plus j dot to string because the name needs to be a string plus i dot to string and lastly we want to make the game object that we just created a child of the suburb and Recall the grid spawner is also a child of the suburb, so they would share the same parent. If we look if we look in here, grid spawner's parent is suburb. So we need to make the our instantiated game object's parent also suburb. In here we type geo.transform.parent equals transform.parent and that basically places it underneath the suburb in the hierarchy. So the next step is to set up a custom editor script that will allow us to put a button in the inspector. So assuming that we typed everything correctly, grid spawner actually has uh, the method to place our prefabs for us, but we don't have a way of actually running that method. So what we need to do is create an editor script inside of our scripts folder. And then inside of the editor script, we'll create a C sharp script, but uh, yeah, a C sharp script named grid spawner editor. And then we'll go ahead and open this up. And for this one, I'm going to cut and paste from this other file. 
And to be perfectly honest, I don't remember the exact code for how to do this. When I see it, it looks familiar, but I always just copy and paste, and uh, half of programming is uh, remembering where you did something last, and that's part of the, the reason for these tutorials, is uh, I'm basically trying to show you the tricks, and then hopefully with some practice, you can learn how to apply them. Uh, so it's in some cases, it's more important to remember uh, where you did something than how to do something. And that's especially true with C-sharp, I think, because it has a really weird uh, kind of sim syntax sometimes. Um, but nevertheless, I'll kind of walk you through what it's doing. Uh, so again, this script also needs using Unity Editor. And where the other script, I can actually kind of spread these out. So this is actually a good trick. So if you drag your... Um, your whatever file you have open, you can actually dock it into here, and then it will put things side by side. Uh, so what I want to show you is that grid spawner is actually a subclass of mono behavior. That means it inherits methods from mono behavior. Mono behavior has a set of methods that are defined, and then grid spawner has those, plus we can define more methods and more attributes on top of that. So that's why we can do do grid spawn. And that's why transform is already available or a uh, game object is already available. There's there's um, a whole set of attributes that we're getting from mono behavior. And then if we look at grid spawn editor, it's actually inheriting from editor. Editor has its own set of methods that are defined. One of those is on inspector GUI that basically uh, gets called here base dot on inspector GUI, and we're saying we don't want to use on inspector GUI. We we want to override it. So in inside of here, we're defining what the override behavior is. So by putting base dot on inspector GUI, we're showing the inspector as it would normally be showing but then we're adding other content to it by finding the script. Target is um, an attribute that gets inherited from editor, and from that we can find our grid spawner script and then add a button to it, and then define what happens when the button gets pressed. So when GUI layout.button is pressed down, then it returns true, and then script.doGridSpawn gets called. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and figure out whether this will work for us or not. Let's give uh, U Unity a second to figure out that our scripts have changed. Okay, so this is a this is a bug that I've seen with this latest version of Unity. If you get multi-object editing is not supported, basically you need to close uh, the editor and restart it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and do that. All right, so we're back. So I actually closed uh, the Unity editor and restarted it. I also closed Visual Studio. I have not restarted it. And um, it might actually work to get rid of that error by just restarting Visual Studio. I can't remember for sure. So I actually want to, uh, well, let's, let's make sure that this house is actually the house in our prefab. And then I'm going to delete it. Actually, before I do that, let's create a house script and, and add it to our house prefab. At this point, we won't worry about changing anything in here. We'll just kind of leave it as is. All right, so when you see this, this basically means uh, Unity hasn't figured out what is going on with the script that you just created. So if we if we just give it a second, it'll kind of figure it out. Uh, there's a couple of quirks, I guess, with Unity. Um, you just kind of learn to live with them. All right, so you know nothing changed except for time, and I was able to place that on there. So now that I've changed this house game object, I need to update my prefab. 
I could also hit apply, that would also work. And then this should be consistent, and I'm going to go ahead and hit this, and boom, we have a grid of houses. We can see they're, uh, they're actually ordered. Um, maybe not the way that you would anticipate, but that's not too bad. Uh, so now we, you could turn this off, but I'm going to choose to just disable it. And we could make Suburb a prefab. And say we wanted to create... Uh, a whole row of prefabs, we could add a empty game object, put it at 50-50, add a game a grid spawner, Actually, not sure what the Y should be, so we might have to test this a little. Alright, so, well, actually, before I do that, I want uh, roads in here, so I actually want to size down my suburb slightly. So I'm going to size it down to 90 by 90. Now we have a border on the edges. I found it's a lot easier to do that after you get everything kind of sorted out in your block. It's a heck of a lot easier, at least for me, to think about how to subdivide things between 100 than to think about how to subdivide them between, you know, 90. Though it's not impossible. So I'll go ahead and update this. And I'll actually uh, delete it out of my scene. And then add suburb there. And then in the forward direction, let's do 2 to start. And then in the right direction, let's do 5. For the forward spacing, we need 100. And then for the right spacing, we need 100. And then we shall do grid spawn. Alright, so yes, that looks like it works. Let's check the uh, Y height. So in this case, in case you're wondering, transform.parent actually happens to be null. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm happy with that. Um, one thing I forgot is uh, our houses on the north side of the suburbs need to be rotated because uh, their, their entrances are on the wrong side. Uh, but luckily, since we kind of have this somewhat automated, that's uh, not a terribly tedious process. So we just want to rotate these on their Y, and we can see all their entrances have rotated. And then we just want to update that, and then we can respawn, and uh, we're back. Okay, so I'm going to call this one good in the... In the next scene, we're actually going to flesh out the house script, which um, actually is going to be the residence script. I kind of forgot about that. I was in a little bit of a rush. So I'll catch you then. Thank you.